Good morning. Um, apology for the delays. We just waiting for one speaker to arrive in a few minutes and then we'll start. So probably five minutes and then we can start. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David. The surname is Melo. I am the acting director of research in the Tabombeki African School of Public and International Affairs. 
and I'm sure some of you are wondering where is this school um, the school is situated somewhere in Irene next to what is known as the Irene farm for the kind words of uh, introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. My name is Ramahwai Mahano. I am currently serving as uh, um, <clears throat> Vice Principal Institutional Development, and I'm doing so on an interim basis. Um, my substantive appointment is that of uh, the, being the executive dean of the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, and this is the college that is responsible uh, of uh, food production. So the, the nourishment that you received uh, this morning uh, is essentially influenced by our teaching and training. Um, on a day like this, there will always be a multiplicity of competing priorities. And unfortunate enough, we are facing exactly that. In, in my mother tongue, my forebears put it aptly and said, Tiro Hadilatani, there will always be competing priorities. Unfortunate enough, as a result of that particular context, the vice chancellor is entangled elsewhere, and she has just instructed me to do the opening address on her behalf. So I would then request you, right, not to see me, but to see the, the vice chancellor. 
and uh, don't be distracted by this horrible voice. Imagine that uh, pleasant uh, feminine voice that she, you know, uh, espouses. To the chair, uh, Professor Milo and uh, Dr. Tozamile Buota from the University of Johannesburg, Professor Sierges Kamcha, Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of the Free State, Professor Sibusiso Vilngomo, the Executive Dean of the Tabumbeki African School of Public and International Affairs, and members of the uh, Tabumbeki School Management, members of the Diplomatic Corps in attendance here this morning, representatives from various institutions of higher learning, government, business, civil society, political fraternity, past and present students of uh, the Tabumbeki African School of Public and International Affairs, members of the university community, distinguished members of the audience, ladies and gentlemen, once more a very good morning to all of you. <coughs> if I have inadvertently missed somebody that I ought to have uh, recognized, please accept my apologies and I trust that uh, through Professor Mello we will amend <coughs> accordingly during the course of the proceedings. On behalf of the University of South Africa, we welcome you to this important seminar. It is fitting that this second seminar on state capture be hosted by the Tabumbeki School for Public and International Affairs. Program Director, it is very important that we know that this year, during which this August University celebrates its 150th birthday. As a matter of fact, uh, it should be actually um, be timed accordingly because this is, this is speaking to the first the seminar that was held. But yes, UNESA has been in existence for one century and a half after its establishment on the 26th of June, 1783. We are pleased to continue to play our role in thought leadership to address challenges facing our country. This is a follow-up conversation on state capture following the seminar we hosted last year, November. Dr. To Tozami Lebuota presented the keynote address defining state captures and their modus operandi and focusing the attention of uh, the audience on state capture experiences beyond South Africa. The lingering question is whether South Africa and indeed the continent fully understand the dynamics of the criminal network of state captures and to what extent countries have been able to address and overcome such systemic corruption. The patron of the Tabombeki Foundation believes state capture should more accurately be understood as a deliberate attempt to undermine and destroy the democratic state, replacing it with a form of corporatist or neoliberal state. He calls it a counter-revolution. I've been asked to provide context, including a brief reflection on the developments since the release of the Zondo Commission's findings on the state capture. Program Director, on account of time constraints, I have deliberately chosen to delimit the background material under the following three key areas. The dynamics of the criminal methods of state captures, the developments since the Zondo report, relevant areas in the report. 
Insofar as the dynamics of the criminal methods of the state captures are concerned, the program director in South Africa, the dynamics of the criminal methods of the state captures focused on the following. Criminal syndicates that used their links with politicians to pursue the criminal activities. The main syndicates were involved in cigarette smuggling, smuggling of coal and fuel destined for ESCOM, and the construction of uh, the, the construction ma mafia, rather. Also, the Gupta family who were involved in the media mining especially coal and ICT. They developed direct relationships with senior politicians who received direct financial benefits from them. They were also unduly involved in the appointment of ministers. Also private sector opportunism, business cooperated with state captures to manipulate contracts produced compromised the services and received exorbitant inflated payments, for example, Bell Pottinger, KPMG, and uh, Wasasa. Political patronage networks is another aspect. Politicians here, senior civil servants, as well as senior state-owned enterprise executives were linked in the networks for access to government contracts and the family members were often involved as decoys or front beneficiaries. As Ahmed et al. 1992 correctly notes, there are many areas in which corruption is likely to take place. Examples include the state corrupt, uh, procurement rather, and tender uh, processes the disposal sale and allotment of government property, embezzlement of public funds, and many other shop floor malpractices. South Africa is by no means an isolated example of corrupt uh, societies or a society burdened by a lack of appropriate response to corruption. It is submitted, however, that what is important is how the country responds to corrupt activities and or to persons acting corruptly. The how part can be determined with reference to the success of the country's anti-corruption agencies and the clamping down of the prevalence and rise of corrupt activities. The country is battling the scourge of corruption and other self-saving behaviors often amongst the upper echelons of governing uh, power as demonstrated by the state capture. Some of the acts of corrup uh, corruption stems from the very same institutions that are meant to be the upper guardians of law and order. Numerous corrupt practices occur almost daily, including, but not limited to fraud, bribery, extortion, nepotism, conflict of interest, cronyism, favoritism, theft, fronting, embezzlement, influence peddling, insider trading, and or abuse of privileged information, biding, ringing, and kickbacks and money laundering, and this has been evident from the Zondo Commission on State Capture. On the one hand, corruption tends to be an individual action that occurs in exceptional cases facilitated by a loose network of corrupt players. It is somewhat informally organized, fragmented, and opportunistic. On the other hand, state capture is systemic and well organized by people with established relations. It involves repeated transactions, often on an increasing scale. The focus is not on small scale looting, but on accessing and redirecting rents away from their intended targets 
into private hands. To succeed, what needs to be eliminated are the following. The high level political protection, including from law enforcement agencies, intense loyalty, and a climate of fear and competitors. State capture and corruption sought to compromise and weaken our democracy and destroy our institutions. Six years to the month since former public protector advocate Tulima Donzella released her state of capture report, the report related an investigation into the complaints of alleged improper and unethical conduct by several state, cap, uh, state functionaries and private individuals and companies. Having witnessed the proceedings of the State Capture Commission for close to four years, South Africans now naturally seek restoration, redress, and accountability. They expect their country's economy and its state to be ethical and free of corruption as it serves the needs and interests of the people. The State Capture Commission report undoubtedly countless that there can be no doubt that state capture happened in South Africa. Government accepted in the main the findings of the commission with respect to the existence nature and extent of state capture in South Africa. Organized corruption is not only about systemic illicit financials gains and undue influence in decision making, but also the systemic buying and influencing of social support to gain or maintain political and economic power. Organized corruption is particularly evident in the political context of transactions towards democracy when key parts of the economy are in the public domain, as is the case in the Western Balkans. In this context, the control of politics and the control of the economy are interlinked. Being in power means controlling the strings of the public purse. Relevant areas in the report include criminal justice actions, numerous persons who have been identified to have committed crimes were identified in the Zondok report. The commission then recommended further investigations by the criminal justice system, such as the Hawks and the NPA. The Independent Investigation Directorate was established in the NPA specifically for this purpose. The Zonda State Capture Commission has been able to provide strong evidence of state capture and detailed insight into how state capture was organized and facilitated by persons in both the public and private sectors. However, the commission and commissions in general was established to investigate a matter of public concern and to report to the president. It is thus not a direct accountability mechanism. It has no power to implement any of its recommendations or to act on any of its findings. Ultimately, the implementation of the Commission's recommendations and indeed any response to the Commission's findings at all is dependent on the will and capacity of those in power to act and on organized civil society's ability to mobilize for change. What is crucial is that uh, the Commission has exposed clear critical weaknesses in the state which need to be actively and effectively addressed by government, whether through investigating and prosecuting corrupt actors, reforming state institutions, or making legislative changes. Just to reflect momentarily on developments and responses since the release of the Zondo report, three main responses to the Zondo report were submitted. 
Firstly, the ANC established a committee chaired by uh, Ndate Jeff Hadebe to present the party's response. It served as a document at the ANC National Conference during the December 2022 conference and the conference re resolutions were adopted in response to it. Secondly, the government drafted a response report and presented it to parliament. It concentrated on criminal justice reforms and improvements and new leg legislation. It also dealt with the reforms of the SOEs, man management practices. Thirdly, Parliament drafted a response report, especially in response to the criticism by J Judge Zondo that it has not done much to implement the report. Just reflecting on the relevant areas in the report pro progress uh, on proposed reforms, the Zondo Commission proposed several institutional reform measures such as a new central anti-corruption council, professionalization of the public procurement function, and electoral reform. These reforms have not been implemented. The Zondo Commission proposed the reform of parliamentary oversight with regard to the executive and senior officials so that they can account for financial mismanagement. There has been little, if any, progress from Parliament to implement this reform of parliamentary oversight. No significant changes in Parliament have been implemented so far. Parliament has defended its progress despite criticism of little progress on the matter. The question is how much progress has been achieved since the Zondo Commission. While there has been substantial progress in some areas, many of the promises made in the President's response were vague and non-committal. He said, for example, that the executive would consider, review, explore, or research certain recommendations made by the commission. Many of these pledges have not yet been turned into tangible commitments or actions. The commission's investigations and recommendations were limited. They were addressed only a few state of rather a few state institutions and key policy issues and did not investigate all aspects of corrupt and state capture. The public expects arrests and court cases, only a few of these in the pipeline or have been finalized. For example, the case was withdrawn in the Estina Dairy Project matter. The Free State Asbestos Project led to the former Secretary General of the ANC, Ndate Ace Mehashule, being charged. In the Transnet case, several senior executives were charged, including former Group CEO Brian Molefe, former CFO Anoj Singh, and former CEO Matsila Koko. The extradition of the Gupta family from United Arab Emirates failed to materialize. The Gupta family acquired citizenship of Vanuatu. The change in their citizenship means that South Africa no longer had the legal basis to demand their extradition because they were no longer South, Af uh, South Africans. The public opinion is however disappointed with the progress in general. In this regard, it is noteworthy that SARS is emerging as an entity that is probably more effective. For example, SARS recently arrested a syndicate of coal smugglers in several provinces. In November 2022, a year almost to date, Parliament published an implementation plan for dealing with the Zondo uh, recommendations, but has however been exceptionally too slow to act. More than a year after the submission of the Zondo Commission, 
while the Zondo Commission's reports have officially been referred to committees, they have yet to be dealt with meaningfully by any of them. However, in June 2023, Chief Justice Raymond Zondo remarked that Parliament would still not be able to stop state capture. I quote, because I have seen nothing that has changed, close quote. Parliament subsequently issued an update on its progress. This update mentions new interventions to strengthen oversight, but did not provide further detail, nor did Parliament show how these interventions will effectively address the structural weaknesses exposed in the Zonda Commission. We welcome you to the seminar on state capture here at UNISA, hosted by the Tabombeki School for Public and International Affairs. We look forward to the inputs by Dr. Tozamile Buota from the University of Johannesburg, Mr. Vincent Mapai from the Tabombegi Foundation, the author, Michael Rong, as well as closing remarks by Prof. Mbongizene Butelesi from the University of Johannesburg. You are invited to rest, uh, the rest rather of the participants to engage with uh, their presentations to add to the thought leadership we value at UNISA. We are actually having you in anticipation of meaningful and thought-provoking engagements. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Mahanu, um, for welcoming us all. But you didn't just welcome us. You actually laid a very solid foundation in terms of the discussions that we are going to have. Uh, and in fact, it was very befitting of you as the substantive uh, dean of uh, the Faculty of Agriculture that in your, in your speech, you also mentioned the Estina Dairy. Just an indication that corruption, you know, uh, it goes in all facets of uh, uh, our life. Now, I'm, I'm going just to introduce to you um, the program as it stands, and then we will uh, go right ahead and call upon one of the panelists to come and join us. Um, we have two panelists. The first one is Dr. Tozamile Bota, uh, who is attached to the University of Johannesburg. And immediately after him, we are going to have Professor Sergis Kamga, who is with the University of uh, Free State. And then the discussion, uh, there's just a correction there, Prof. Mahanu. Uh, the discussion is going to be facilitated by Professor Mkize. Professor Mkize is going to be joining us virtually. I hope that uh, he is connected as we speak. Prof, if you can hear me, uh, just say something so that I know that you are there with us. And then after the facilitated discussion, we will then have uh, Professor Charlotte Beitendach, who is going to give us the concluding remarks. Now, at this stage, I'm going to, uh, or even before that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a number of seats that are empty in front. So if you feel like moving from the back and coming to the front, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are more than welcome. At this stage, I'm going to call upon uh, Dr. Tozamile Bota to come and address us on the issue of state capture. And I'm going to give him not more than 30 minutes, but I know he can do it in 20 minutes. Thank you, for, uh, Doctor. <laughs> The program director, the honorable guests from the visitors office and from the Mbeki Foundation, 
or school, Ambassador uh, Honorable guests, I know the representative of the university has already touched, followed the protocol to the detail. I don't want to bore you with the same uh, detailed protocol. Safe to say, protocol is uh, observed. How do I get into state capture? Now, I presented a lecture last year on state capture, and I indicated that state capture is not new. The concept itself originates from Hellman and Kaufman from when they were analyzing the transition period from the USSR to Russia uh, in, the, in two, from, two, from 1999, during the Gorbachev period, when he introduced the concept perestroika and glasnost, there was hope raised by many people within and outside of, of the Soviet Union. That democracy is going to be injected in the society. There were people satisfied with Gorbachev, but there were also those who were very upset, uncertain, and in fact, criticizing him for being slow with the process. But particularly the Americans were concerned that Gorbachev started something that they admired, but they were worried about his intentions. Because the world we live in is bipolar. And the Americans had hoped that Gorbachev was going to kill the other Poles. And America would, or the world would become a unipolar system. Let me just pause there. That does not answer this question that has been lingering question that says, is there really a state capture, or this is very, just an academic narrative? There are many people, maybe even in this audience, that are asking this question. Or put differently, what are the characteristics or manifestations of state capture? My approach to state capture is that, like the professor indicated, there's corruption involved, there's involvement of civil public servants and politicians, there's involvement of business, local businesses and so forth. But I say state capture is much deeper than that. I trace it back to the 1884 Charter of Imperialism. Maybe people have not seen or read the provisions of that charter. The motto of the Imperialist Charter clearly indicates that no third world country shall be independent or enjoy sovereignty. That's what it says. If you follow Chiwambori Kwa, 
she's very much fascinated by what France is doing to its former colonies. And France is one of the good examples of the countries that are stuck religiously to the provisions of the Charter. It clearly says, when it comes to mineral resources under the soil, France has got the right of refusal before you appoint anybody. And if you defy, we have a military that will protect our interests within that country. It goes further to say any country's reserves must not exceed a certain ceiling. And up to 85% of the reserves of a country should be deposited in the treasury of France. If you, the former colony, want some, uh, some extra money, you will borrow it at an interest. This emanates from the Charter of Imperialism, the foundation stone of that. Further, I have a book here, it's called Confessions of an Economic Hitman, Man in Plural. This is written by John Perkins, who is a member, who is a former member of what he called international hitmen, who worked in the financial institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF. He says in his writing, he wrote a couple of times a manuscript for this book and gave it to a number of people to read. This is from the 70s to the 80s. And he finally wrote and released this book in 2017. All the way through, he had been discouraged. Please be careful for your life or of your life. If you release this book, many people will not be happy. And if they are not happy, you are in trouble. He calls himself a whistleblower. And he gives an account of the economic hitman. He said, inside the corrupt world of economic hitmen, coercing people, countries, into accepting huge development loans so they were forever in debt to U.S. organizations. He explains how these techniques are increasingly used around the world by the corporatocracy. A vast solutions of U.S. and international corporations, banks, and the rich and powerful who run them. So instead of looking to the small civil servant who works in your department, who circumvented the rules and regulations of employment, procurement, 
etc. You might find that that decision was taken in New York. Because when the IMF and World Bank come in to say we want structural adjustment in a country, structural adjustment entails replacing the good men and women in those positions and put agents of the corporate structure and the financial institutions elsewhere. There are different strategies they all employ with one objective, maximize returns to the small group that will eventually benefit from this. So the purpose is to actually ascend to power using the mechanisms created within the state or the loopholes in the system, they always exploit to their advantage. Why Kaufman and Hellman in Russia looked at what was happening? They discovered that the CIA had won over to its side the KGB in Russia. Some of the, of the communist members from the Politburo in Russia, they were not comfortable with Gorbachev. Some of them thought he was selling out. The oligarchs who were corrupt, the business oligarchs, who were corrupt, were afraid that if they are caught, they might be arrested. They wanted protection. The CIA worked together with them to ensure that that protection is provided. And how were they going to provide it? Among other things, they had Yels, Boris Yeltsin on their side, who was uncomfortable to an extent with, with Gorbachev. He was afraid that he was too slow. He liked the perestroika glasnost, but he was slow. But Yeltsin was the president of one of the provinces or states, Russia. He was not president of the Soviet Union. The United States wanted Yeltsin to take over and become the president because he was more in their fold. Members of the KGB, of the Poli political bureau, of the US went to visit Gorbachev in his holiday place, approached him nicely, said, President, the country is in a very bad state. I think you must announce to the world, to the country, that you are sick and step out of the office. We have somebody that we think we'll put in that place. And indeed, they started making the preparations for his replacement. Fortunately, Yeltsin had a presence of mind he intervened on behalf of Gorbachev. He said, please don't proceed with this coup attempt. Brought in the army, stopped the whole thing.
But during that period, there was something equivalent to what Tuolima Donsela referred to in the case of South Africa. There is a state of, there's a presence of a state of capture. Now when we talk about a state, of a state of war, the implication is that already all the preparations are in place to take over or to go to war. The only difference would be that the war is not officially declared or has not been officially declared. But otherwise, all the necessary ingredients of a war are in place. So is the case, or was the case, when Tulima Donsela, six, seven years ago, said there is a state of capture in South Africa. Or they, not, not, he didn't say there's a state of capture. He said there's, there are conditions for a state of capture, basically. Now, what does that mean? He had already identified all the things that uh, Professor had mentioned here. The attempt to take over SARS. The attempt to take over Treasury. The attempt to take over some of the strategic parastate or state-owned enterprises, transport-related. South African Airways, Transnet. These were critical institutions. In looking at all of this, I have had people asking me a couple of times, what is the definition of state capture? Having listened to all of this and read all of this literature, I thought I might want to attempt uh, to a risk of being uh, attacked. And I want to read my attempted definition of state capture. I attempt to define it in as follows. State capture is an institution, institutionalized, systemic corrupt operation driven from the top offices of developing countries, supported by a network of multilateral financial institutions, including the CIA and other alliances, alliance partners, multinational corporations, and local business oligarchs and local mafia gangs whose objective is to ascend to state power with the object of influencing decisions and to circumvent state resources away from the legitimate beneficiaries. Their modus operandi is to corrupt highly placed and highly paid officials within the state institutions to bend the procurement rules and recruitment guidelines in order to be able to place their agents in strategic positions within state organs. They plan nationally and internationally and operate locally. The operations of state capture are invisible or camouflage, but the results are tangible and localized. I'm therefore saying it is not correct to say that we can't define state capture because it doesn't have a structure. It very much has a structure or has a structure. If you talk about institutions, international institutions like AMF and the World Bank, using local leaders 
at political level, and the local banking institutions who are networked with those international multilateral, institution, multilateral institutions, including multilateral corporations, multinational corporations rather, that are operating both nationally and locally. It is that, it is that invisible connection that enables state capture operations to be clandestine. And somebody said, in fact, former President Zuma said, there cannot be state capture unless all organs of state are captured. Now, in the last presentation or the lecture that I gave, this question was raised again. And I made reference to some of the arguments uh, made by a person like Chabalala, Mulifi Chabalala, who actually agreed to some extent with President Zuma. I say to some extent because he qualified his support by saying it cannot happen without capturing certain institutions, but if you look at the concept of nepotism uh, and uh, the traditional structures where you operate under a chief. He says, South Africa, in fact, Zuma was operating uh, like under the, he used the concept patrimonialism, which explains that the power comes from the top and instructs it down. So in this case, there are situations, a number of them, where the idea of restructuring South Africa, SARS, for example, that decision was negotiated nationally. The appointment of the commissioner of SARS was negotiated at the top. The idea of replacing the minister of finance was to cripple treasury. Now, I, when I refreshed my memory on this, I said the only best way to explain, to answer those people who are asking, can a state be captured, was to draw an analogy between the human body, or human body, the functioning of the human body organs and the organs of state. Forgive me if I'm going to bore you, but I'm going to make this parallelism. I talked to my, a friend of mine, who's a medical doctor, and I said, tell me, which organs of the human body are so critical that if you touch or if you disturb, it, it will affect the entire body. And he says to me, let's look at the bone structure of the human body. The structure of the human body is encasing the organs of the human body. It contains There are certain organs of the body that you can dispense with without completely destroying the capability of the body to function. But there are some organs that if you injure or you disturb, might affect the entire body. We started. Which ones? It says, inside the bones, like a state, the state 
has to have a defined territory, land. It has a constitution that defines the parameters of the land and the boundaries. The land becomes so important, it's not just a, an empty vessel. Below the soil, there are mineral resources, or the soil itself might be fertile for agriculture. I'm glad you, you, you probably explain it better than I do. That's how, because the state, once you have that boundary, inside it you must have a population, and that population has to leave. So, like treasury, if the land does not produce enough wealth or revenue, when I say land, I mean the land and the population, the business and everything that lives in it. There will be no money that goes, that SARS collects. And if SARS does not collect revenue, there will be nothing that goes to treasury. In the same way that he says to me, the bone marrow manufactures blood, and that blood goes to the liver, which purifies it before it pumps to the heart. And it's the heart that then sends it and delivers it to the brain and all the other parts, parts of, the, of the body. That says to me the economy is very important. Therefore, that's why the bone structure is important, because the mar marrow is contained in there. So you don't start with treasury. You start with where does treasury gain, gets its resources to be able to deliver to the different departments, education, health, housing, social welfare. Because once those things, those departments do not receive enough support, there's going to be revolt in the country. The same way that if the bone marrow does not manufacture blood, there'll be nothing pumped into the liver. And a bloodless body is dead anyway. So this is the parallel that I thought I must draw to illustrate that you touch the heart, you touch the liver, in this case, I can rightly or wrongly compare and say your liver is supposed to be collecting, purifying, and so forth. So SARS collects and clean like the liver. Treasury distributes these resources to the other organs of the body. Therefore, if the blood is not manufactured, there's nothing for the liver to do. And if the liver doesn't pump blood to the heart, there's nothing for the heart to deliver to the other organs of the state. And in the social context, treasury in fact, all of this, Treasury, uh, SARS, uh, the Minister of Economics, uh, and so forth, all operate under the organ of state called the executive. The executive operates under the watchdog role of parliament, because parliament has got what is called portfolio committees that monitor performance. They are watchdogs. But compliance with the law 
is done by the judiciary. But within the state organ, the executive, there are other institu critical institutions which assist the liver to purify the blood, the state security organs. If those organs are themselves infiltrated, like the South African State uh, Agency, then all that the heart will pump is a blood that has contracted viruses, which will contaminate the greater part of the body in the same way that today we have a state of capture in the country. I agree with the professor that we are in a cliff or on a cliff. We are hanging on a cliff. All you need is just to push it a little bit. Then the country will be in a full-blown capture situation. Right now, we still have the executive functioning. We still have parliament in place. We still have the judiciary working. So in my view, they are not fully captured, but they are in a state of capture. The preparations are in place. All that you need is a pronunciation. Of course, uh, Zondo, uh, Judge Zondo has already said there's a state of capture. But of course, in my view, that statement needs to be more analyzed and questioned. I say there are conditions, ex the con there are conditions of existence of state capture. I repeat, there are conditions of existence of state capture but not a full-blown state capture. Why do I say there are conditions? Because already you find right from the presidency, not the president, a chief director in charge of planning, monitoring, and evaluation, who's accused of some corrupt practice. He then says, because of this situation, a post is advertised, or posts are advertised, including his post. He sets up an interviewing panel, and when the security organs are saying we're going to investigate. They say, no, hold on. Oh, no, the Public Service Commission says we must investigate these allegations that were brought by the union. He says, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to handle this myself. He presides over the committee that appoints people to positions within that sector. Of course, he appoints them, including himself. And then he says to Public Service Commission, don't worry. Don't go on with this investigation. Because I've dealt with it. I've, gave them a, I've given them a warning, those who are accused, including himself. Remember, he was one of the ones who investigated. So he, he warned himself. That I shouldn't do this again. So that is an indication of how deep the notion of state capture and the practice within the state organs is. Thank you very much. Dr. Bota, thank you very much for that um, deep analysis in terms of the origin, the manifestation of state capture. Now, as you were talking about the involvement of Russia in Africa, 
I'm actually thinking of what is happening in Niger, what is happening in Burkina Faso, because it means that African countries are now saying that we revolting against the capture, our capture, by another country that is sitting somewhere in Europe, but dictating how do we, do we use our own mi minerals. Thanks for giving us uh, that definition of um, state capture, um, the manifestation of a state capture, and where it thrives. As you say, in procurement, in recruitment, that's where the mafias are starting, because once they get hold of those, um, then they can be able to take over easily um, the state. And I'm sure um, what state capture entails is something that we can debate, and I'm sure the audience are also having questions, but I'm going to ask you for now to hold on to those questions uh, as I call the, the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Professor Serge Kamga. Uh, Prof. Serge Kamga, I'm going to tell them that you, you were working with us. He decided to leave us to go to the University of Free State, but I'm sure someday we can be able to reclaim what is ours by, by bringing you back. Um, Prof. Kamga is going to be talking about illicit financial flows. He has done extensive research on, uh, on this subject, and there is also a collaboration between us and his uh, school in terms of uh, looking into aspects of illicit financial flows. Um, Prof. Kanga, um, the podium is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. What I would like to start with, uh, I'll stand on all protocol, uh, that uh, established protocol by saying all protocol observe. And uh, I would like to say it's a great pleasure to be back at UNISA and specifically at the Tabun Bekti School after spending 12 years of my life at this school. So I've been here for some time. It's a pleasure to come back, to be involved with the program today. Before um, I left the, I will say before I went to, to the Free State, the, I, I had great time working here at the school. And I had to, well, it happened that I had to change. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here, and I will discuss today uh, illicit financial flows, uh, which is, of course, the way uh, it's a road that state capture uh, uses to hide or hide the proceeds of corruption. I want to call the talk I will have today, I will say illicit financial flows uh, as a ma major obstacle to the South African transformative agenda. We, we need to look at it perhaps from that uh, particular perspective. Uh, we will perhaps in this quick talk look at the taximony or type of illicit financial flows, what is illicit financial flows, uh, we look at briefly illicit financial flows in South Africa. Then we check the impact on the transformation of the country. And we look at the few pathways to combat illicit financial flows. I would like to start by saying that uh, with the advent of democracy in 1994, we all celebrated, we had in 19, then we adopted our constitution in 1996. Uh, we celebrated looking at the content of the constitution, looking at the right in the Bill of Rights, looking at the separation of powers between the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. Uh, 
the Constitution was so much celebrated to the extent that people like Professor Karl Klar said uh, South Africa has adopted a transformative constitution, uh, hoping that what we normally call service delivery was going to become a reality, or rather the distribution and the enjoyment of human rights and equality was going to define the way forward. Uh, however, we now realize that South Africa is one of the most inequal society in the world, with poverty being a serious pro problem. And why so? Then comes the question of illicit financial flows. And when you look at the question of illicit financial flows, what are they? You know, there is no agreed definition of illicit financial flows. Uh, however, the literature, the literature tells us that illicit financial flows will include tax evasion, tax avoidance, criminal activities, corruption, and in the case of South Africa, we can contextualize it in the form of state capture. I want to sp spend a minute uh, defining uh, what is tax evasion. It, it's a blatant violation of a nation's tax law. So where people try their utmost best to refuse to pay taxes, either by under-invoicing exports or over-invoicing imports. And that's what happens when people try to evade tax taxes. Now, on the other hand, you have tax avoidance, which is basically a profit shifting where transnational cooperation takes advantage of tax rate differ differential across jurisdiction and shift taxable income and asset away from source countries. So while not strictly illegal, it's very immoral. And many companies will, will do that in their tax planning, try to avoid uh, to pay taxes. Uh, I want to say, and beside that, you have criminal activities. In criminal activities, you see drug smiling, you see human trafficking, you see a lot of corruption, you see state captures. Uh, perhaps one of the things that we might add on state capture, I, won't, I don't want to take a lot of time because it was very well deconstructed by previous speakers. Uh, I will say we must recall that this takes place in a context of a deep state, a state under the state that, that try to control what we see at the surface. So, and when this happened, uh, all the money that is stolen is taken somewhere with the help of the deep state. And that's why we cannot ignore other role players like international banks, because to do that, all the money stolen should be taken to safe havens or safe country jurisdictions. Uh, now, let's look at quickly, let's quickly look at just two statistics on illicit financial flows from South Africa. Uh, just between uh, 2002 and 2011, South Africa has lost like one billion rand to illicit flows yearly. Now, earlier reports show that South Africa has been experiencing a huge amount of flows, illicit flows, since 1994. In fact, it has reached 23.7 billion rand in 2011. Now, you have, this takes place in the form of trade mispricing uh, for over 80% of illicit flows. So that's uh, some numbers from Global Financial Integrity Report and UNECA. Uh, 
the recent, the recent data, which is very shocking, is like a, a 20, 2023 report. Uh, in South Africa loss, uh, is losing in terms of trace, uh, missing voicing. Uh, it's, a, it's equal as to 21.9 billion uh, and 40.4 billion outwards. This is really shocking uh, in terms of numbers and figures. So when we lose this amount of money, it, it becomes completely impossible to bring the right in the Bill of Rights to reality. How can we uh, make the Constitution or the right provided for in the Constitution, how can we make this right a reality if the national treasury is empty due to illicit financial flows? How can we, as a country, uh, deliver services to the poor or the very poor if all the money is stolen? Uh, you know, it, the flows, these illicit financial flows will reduce uh, domestic expend expenditure and investment from both public and private sector. We cannot uh, make, we cannot transform the country into an equalitarian one if people generally take the money away in a very illegal way. Because if I recall well, when you do these things legally, you cannot easily take more than one million rand per year out of the country, unless you have really to be scrutinized and we, the, the treasurer must understand why you are taking the money and where the money is going to. However, with, with illicit financial flows, you always have a foreign role players like safe havens. And that's why in the context of state capture, we understood that a lot of meetings took place in Dubai, uh, in Geneva, in India, in other places where uh, surely, surely money was hidden. Now, how do we resolve this problem? And I am very happy because this was covered by previous speakers. Uh, before me. Here we need to improve governance. As much as we have all these reforms that a, a, a professor spoke about before leaving, these reforms are meaningless for the man on the street. They want to see accountability. We, the Zondo report, if after a few years is put on the drawer, you don't see accountability, you don't see responses, people will still try their ways to capture the state, to capture the resources of the state. Accountability is key. We are talking of collaboration between law enforcement agencies. Is all this collaboration will lead uh, to, to arrest, and if people arrested are not charged, what does it mean? It becomes meaningless if there is no accountability. When we talk of, so the accountability of the culprit is important. Of course, we understand the challenges uh, due to the fact that many people or many entities are, are not easily uh, likely to be arrested. For instance, the Guptas who went away, changed their nationalities. But those that remain and that are known must be held must accountable. That's the only way to bring back the public trust to the state, whereby the people see that action has been taken, that things has been done to ensure that this never happened again. Because uh, the situation is one of the key challenges to this is that most of the time everything has been politicized in South Africa. Even if you arrest someone, it becomes, it just comes against this camp and we forget the problem at stake. 
Now we, the narrative is this, fa this camp is facting this camp, this faction against this faction. But in reality, when there is load shedding because there is no money or because coal was stolen or because de deals were made, the poor suffer. We, now when uh, everything or the media, everything is discussed, it's like it's not anymore about state capture. Who should be held accountable? Why and how? All these questions come to the table, but nobody understands that we're trying uh, to hold those that are accountable. I don't believe that the Zondo report will be impactful if at the end of the day it's business as usual. I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Prof, um, for linking illicit financial flows to um, corruption as well as state capture. And you can just imagine the figures that he is quoting. If that money or a good percent of it was to be deposited into SARS in the form of taxation, um, what is it that we were going to achieve? We are going to be able to uh, invest money to create employment, to fight poverty that we're having in South Africa. And uh, I'm sure you also have a number of questions for him. Let me check if um, Prof Mkize is online with us. Prof Mkize, if you are there, show your face. Uh, if not, um, then I'll proceed. Are you, are you able to show your face, Prof Mkize? You, you, you are supposed to facilitate the discussion with the audience. I'm not so sure if you can see the audience or uh, maybe you're going to do yes, it with my Prof. help. Yes, I'm, I'm showing my face. All right, yes. <laughs> but I just want to know, can you see our audience? because you will be facilitating the discussion with the audience. Yeah. All right, I, I believe it's going to be very difficult. Let me help you. You, you can uh, come in uh, from time to time. Yes, I can. I think what you can help me with, Prof, is to maybe give the, the audience the mic. All right, I'll, I'll help you to identify oh, yes. people who are going to talk, um, and then you can come in from time to time. Thank you. It, it is now time for us to, we have listened to um, the, the two keynote speakers, and I'm sure we are having questions. And I'm sure we're having comments. Uh, let's keep our questions and comments very brief, because the more people we can allow to have a say, the more we're going to be able to uh, get a lot of ideas that can be used by Prof. Uh, Serge Gamga, that can be used by uh, Dr. Buota, in terms of their future research so that we build this country. Now, um, we open in the floor for questions and comments. Okay, I see the first one here. We'll take the first round and then we'll come for the second one. The, the first one here from, I think, the, our ambassador, and then the second one right at the back, and then I saw another hand right in front uh, Mashaba, our student, is here. is also raising his hand. Uh, and then the last question would be yourself, Sisi. Um, as you pose your question, um, identify yourself and again be as brief as you can. All right, we'll start here, sir. Okay, um, Ambassador Dr. Obodozi. I 
state capture here. It's, uh, it's your internal affairs because uh, you know the Sangoma to approach to solve your problems. As a Nigerian, I cannot tell you. Oh, okay. As a Nigerian, I cannot tell you what to do in your country, but I can tell you how we see it in my place. Then you can extrapolate and do whatever you want to do with it. You are supposed to eat your bread with butter. Standard practice all over the world. In South Africa, in Nigeria, in the US, in, uh, in the Americas, the Europe, Asia, and Pacific. You eat your bread with butter. It is allowed. The only problem is when the butter is more than the bread. <laughs> That's what we say in Nigeria. So it's left for you to find out how it affects you. I'm not the one to tell you how it affects you, but in my country, when the butter is more than the bread, people start wondering whether, is it the bread you want to eat or the butter? So if you look at it at the state level in every country, and then for those who have control over others, like the ones mentioned the actors mentioned by uh, Professor Bota under the 1884 Bismarck demarcation of Africa. It is the same thing about the butter. What we are saying is that they made sure that in however they exploit the resources, whether mineral or agricultural, that the butter will always be more than the bread when they are exploiting. They are not doing it for you, like you mentioned. It is for their own benefit. I, I will say the fish gets rotten from the head. Once it goes rotten in the head, the whole body follows. But sometimes, a healthy fish is not allowed to stay in power. They remove it. You have mentioned it. They remove that healthy fish. And they prefer the one, the fish with the rotting head because it will allow them to steal, to eat, have more butter on their bread. That's all. Leadership, that's the answer to the, my own, my personal opinion. Uh, my respect to all those who are here, the members of the chair, the members of the diplomatic corps, and the uh, fellow participants. Please. Uh, thank you very much for noting me. My name is Dumelo Lucas Mutawu, and I'm a student chair at Chinisa. So with regards to what I have to say, I don't necessarily have any comments, but talking to the chair is a good thing that you bring up. With regards to what has been said, with what has been said about the charter of the colonizers of the 1800s, in 2023 you highlighted how deep into colonization, or in fact imperialism, we are. Most South Africans have no idea how captured the state actually is or was. As you've highlighted, it's something that has been in the pipeline even before the Guptas arrived into South Africa. How do we, and this is my question, Dr. Bota, how do we as South Africans recapture the state? One would say if, that if using- If you can just stand up, please, oh. for purposes of our cameras. So Dr. Bota, as I was saying, as one of my questions, how do we as South Africans recapture the state? I mean. The economy, as you've mentioned, is the bloodline behind a country. 
So one would say us using the South African Reserve Bank, a private company, to work with, or if not dictate how Treasury increases inflation or interest rates as our agent to control our money is more to our detriment than our benefit. It being a private company allows for foreign forces with more money than all South Africans put together that allows them to have a foot into how our finances are run. And with regards to Professor Kamka, you've highlighted that in order for state capture to exist, there needs to be some type of deep state that controls what happens, what we can see. So with that being said, which state-owned institutions would be complicit in the existence of a deep state and have their, well, their hands all over our business? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next, the third hand was over there. Okay, good morning. Um, Tinashe Chukwata, I am a professor at the University of the Western Cape's Faculty of Law, and thank you very much for the invitation. I've got uh, three questions here. The first question uh, slash comment relates to the definition provided by uh, Professor Botha regarding the, de the, uh, the definition of state capture. I think they you were right to identify the actors that are involved in their end goal. But what I would like to, I think, pose to you is the, so the main issue in your definition was about the bending of rules, whether with regards to procurement or appointment of staff. But in some other cases, it may also involve inaction from uh, relevant state in institutions to, in, to enable uh, certain transactions to take place. So that's something I just want to, to add to what you, you have already provided. Then the second question relates to the issue of state capture. If you look at the, the public domain and most of the discussions, it's about capturing of national institutions or institutions at national level. So public enterprises, national treasury, and many others. But there's also capture of state institutions at local level. I think in South Africa, it's quite documented that there are certain cities that have already been captured, maybe even before the state capture happened at the national level. But yet when you, in the public domain, in these discussions, the focus is often on uh, capture at national level, as if the capture of local institutions is not important. Yet, as the second speaker spoke about, the new constitution is about human rights and service delivery. And who is responsible for service delivery? It's municipalities. It's the cities. It's not the national government. The national government is responsible for other functions, but the primary function for service delivery is with the municipalities. My last uh, question uh, is on illicit financial flows from the last speaker. If you could just comment on the how gl globalization has enabled uh, illicit financial flows. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. I'm Nandi Panzaloba from Faculty of Law. Thank you for the powerful presentations. Allow me to, to address myself to Prof. Botha. I'm actually studying your book here, the book that you, you've, you've, you've referred us to, The Confessions. But I want to, to, to take you to the preface, and, and I would want you to dissect it for me in terms of why you are here and how we found ourselves where we are. Is. South Africa. He says, uh, he calls it EHM, uh, and he talks about the multilateral organs that we have used in South Africa as part of um, development. We're still using some, but I was drawn to two parts. He says, I should know I am an economic hitman. He further then goes down and indicates how protracted it was for him to publish. You left how he ended up doing it. He then says, till my daughter said. So I'm, I'm addressing two things then. One, I would want you to talk about the role of the national key points and the managing, and management thereof. And I'm taking them for a, for a reason because having been within the defense space, 
national key points are dealt with differently in terms of whom, who's there, and how you manage them. Secondly, then, I would want you to talk to us about the first-hand documentation of what has happened and how that would assist us moving forward. Thirdly, is it very true that all EHMs know that they are EHMs? And if then that is not the case, how would you assist as not only an intellectual, intellectual but as a military veteran? How can it be possible for one to be able to decipher signs of EHM? And how then do you brush yourself out of it? Thank you. Question, I think, is going to come from Mr. Mashaba. Chair of the session. My name is Johannes Mashaba. I'm one of the students at Abombegi School. I also work in one of the national government department. Uh, maybe I've got just a point and a comment. The first point is that as things stand, after the closure or recommendation of Zondo Commission, little, little has been done. But uh, corruption, it is still going on. Now, the challenge that I'm having standing here is that in the country, we seem to be looking specifically at the politicians. And uh, we have got government departments that are run. And uh, that is where things are happening. And uh, the Zondo Commission didn't touch those government departments. Now, with all these syndicates that are operating within the government department, what is it? that we should do as the country in order to stop those things. Because I can assure you, recently you have been reading in the newspapers other departments, two laptops for about two million. Five billion uh, out of other departments. So those are horrible things. And uh, when you check what is it that the national leadership or the executive is doing, at times <laughs> you don't understand that maybe they don't follow the events as we see as the public because they are not doing anything. Now, responding to that, I'm saying to the public, we must not despair. And uh, I'll bring an example you see, when our leaders were arrested, leaders of the ANC in particular were arrested at Rivonia trial, there was a lull in the country. Everybody was scared that we will be taken to follow those leaders. And uh, those people with confidence, with no guns, they send inspiring messages that we are going to win this battle. And I'm saying to the public, wherever you are, in the little, in the big department, continue fighting this corruption. Even if it doesn't, it doesn't stop it today, but rest assured, we'll get there. This is the point that I think I must make it so that we must not rest in our laurels and think that, I we are a failed state. We can still win. Thank you very much. All of us say no to corruption. It won't have any space. 
I will call upon uh, uh, Dr. Botha to respond to the set of questions that was addressed to him. And immediately after that, uh, Prof. Kamga, come to the podium. Program facilitator, <coughs> quite a number of very complex and difficult questions were raised, and some of them, the answers are not like a ballot answer, uh, they need some explanation. Now, the first uh, question by the uh, ambassador uh, is about the bread and the butter being more than the bread. <laughs> now, <coughs> I thought I understood, but I'm not sure if I did. Uh, when you referred, Prof, uh, Ambassador, to the charter of imperialism and the extraction of the minerals under the ground. Uh, then you brought in this bread butter analogy. I was trying to understand exactly which one is bread and which one is butter. Uh, can you please clarify that part? Is it? Uh, can you give the ambassador the mic so that he can clarify? Uh, who is bread and who is butter? <laughs> uh, Professor Botta, you know, they always say that we diplomats, we never say what we mean, <laughs> and we never mean what we say. <laughs> I have to be careful. Like I told you, it is uh, your terrain. In private, I can tell you, but <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, because uh, the reason why I put it that way is that when I'm called from out there, because none of you will be there to defend me, <laughs> that is why I am not in prison or going to jail or anything. I retired 13 years ago, but most of most, some of my colleagues are already in prison or preparing to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to live clean. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, that's why I talked about leadership. This fish, if it's rotting at the head, the whole body follows. But if the fish is clean at the head, it's, it's healthy. The body will follow, but they never allow the clean fish to stay because they want to benefit because of, they want more butter on their bread. Okay. And you know those, they have removed them. Kwame uh, Nkrumah, uh, you know what happened to him. Patrice uh, Lumumba. Um, Lumumba, the man in uh, Burkina Faso, Sankara. I can continue to name them. Those clean fishes, they are removed. They prefer rotting heads okay. so they can benefit. I don't want to say more. No, but I've, I've, I think I hear you. Uh, yes, I have said as much as, as far as I can go. <laughs> uh, can I, and I, I think I have an idea. I think I have an idea. I'll go back to the charter of imperialism which clearly says that when you discover resources in your country, you can't extract those resources without informing us and giving us the first option to decide whether we're going in or not. Now, with minerals under the, so under the ground, the countries might detect that there's uranium, there's oil, 
but the country does not have enough resources to extract that which is under the ground. That's when they approached the head of the fish to say, can you please, we have the money to actually help you dig out those minerals. But then they will tell, give conditions that we will take 85% of the value of those minerals. We will give you and your children scholarships to go and study in the US. We'll buy you yachts and the beautiful cars. In other words, you might be able to take 10%, 5% of that 15% that we have living. And part of it will go to your son. The example of Equatorial Guinea. where Nguema takes a big slice of the resources. The children study other, under street lights on the pavement. When the son buys all the beautiful things that Michael Jackson left behind, and yachts. So that is where the problem is. And unfortunately, it's not just Nguema who decides that. Because if that oil is extracted by uh, Exxon or Shell, France must have gone in there and said, because France has given the condition that I have the first right of refusal on these uh, uh, resources. So it becomes a network. So France must consult with Exxon and see what benefits they will get from that. So it's not just a one-man show. It becomes more complex than that. So I, I'm just making a comment. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. I don't know if there was a question, but you are alerting us to the complexity of the problem. That is why I was saying state capture begins with the Charter of Imperialism of 1884-85. There's a question that, oh, somebody asked the question, how would we, uh, how could we intervene and stop this corrupt practice? If you say the international uh, banks are involved, you have the Reserve Bank in South Africa that is run by a private, uh, or has got an element of private uh, shareholders in it and therefore private shareholders are independent, they're not controlled by the state. They may do what they want. Uh, well, I think the Reserve Bank in South Africa, although it has private participation, it's largely, the big slice of it is owned by the state. Please correct me, I, I'm not, Prof, uh, Prof uh, you might have a better uh, interpretation and explanation on that. Uh, I'm not very competent to answer this question. Uh, <clears throat> then let me quickly go uh, to the definition of state capture uh, and also cases where transactions go through. Uh, oh yeah, this was about corruption is not only taking place within the state. There are private entities, private companies, parastatals, where corruption takes place and does not only focus on politicians. So how do we intervene in the space of other different entities that are not necessarily politicians or controlled by politicians but by uh, civil society or civilians. You know, in this thing, state capture, there's a 
corruption, corrupter and the corrupted. So it's always going to be a third party kind of engagement. Now, <clears throat> sometimes the corrupter is able to look at the condition of the person they are targeting for to be corrupted. I don't know if I did say that. In most cases, corruption takes place in states of transition or in conditions of transition. Why transition? Because, first of all, if there's a, like let's take the World, the, 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 the World Bank and the IMF, they always come in with structural adjustments. Structural adjustments always result in unemployment. Many people are thrown out. In that situation, there are two groups of people that are vulnerable. The working class, if companies close down, they are the first to lose jobs and become unemployed. The lower middle class, which I call the precarious group in society, because a middle class who has taken a bond who's paying a bond in a house and a beautiful car, if he or she gets restructured or reshuffled and loses or even loses his or her job, is very fragile and vulnerable. He will then the corruptor comes in and say, I can do X, Y, Z, provided. Now, I'll give you so much money, provided to do X, Y, Z. Now, that's when an innocent, poor person who's potentially exposed to being thrown out of the job gets corrupted. And then he or she willingly goes and bends the rules to conduct or carry out an illegality or an illicit action. One good example, if you take the township development program, which says that 30% of the contractor's value of the contract must go to local communities. And when you win this contract, you have to look for a local group that is going to implement this part of the contract, or 30% value of the contract. And that individual organization was not part of the tender process. Only is going to be brought after and you, the contractor who has won this contract legally and ethically, you are now forced because the community is contesting for this, competing for this tender, for this 30%. And they are fighting amongst themselves to a point of killing one another. And you can't continue to implement the contract because they will stop you from implementing it. So you end up getting into a situation of bribes and succumbing to political pressure. And this is what is happening. And we know, and I'm sure many of you have got examples of where people have been killed, construction companies have suffered as a result of procedures not being followed. For example, for me, from my point of view, I would not say let the contractor go and look for a subcontractor who's going to take part of it. I would have included that to the tender document to say those from the community who have the capability to deliver on this thing must please be assessed together with the rest of the contract. That's my view. You see. Now, <coughs> uh, 
So I'm not sure if I answered this question. I'm making comments on some of them. Uh, Eddie. There's a question about the role of national key points. Ma'am, uh, I'm not sure what the issue is on the national key points. Uh, but let me answer the part that refers to the hitman. Now, yes, you are right. Uh, I did not go to the detail of how he decided to write this book. At what point he did decide. He decided on writing that book, I think 70, 70 something. But every time he was ready to publish it, he was stopped. A warned. You do it, you are in trouble. You might be dead. The only time he decided to write the book and publish it, in fact, he says, the only reason he decided to write the book and publish it is uh, the security he had was the book itself, was actually the story itself. Because the daughter, when he disclosed, the daughter said, Dad, go ahead and publish this. If they do anything to you, we will continue on your footsteps and publish the book. So the daughter didn't say, oh, I will lose my daddy. No, he said, I am prepared to sacrifice for the sake of the public, the people who are losing out because of the extortion, the corruption, the diversion of resources that are conducted and carried out by these multinational corporations that we work for. So in essence, he says, finally, I decided to publish the book. But you can see from the time he started to now, maybe he said, I'm old enough. If I die, what change does it make anyway? Or what difference does it make? But he took the risk. Related to that, I just want to say the question that was raised about some of this corruption is happening at municipalities and local level and so forth. In my presentation earlier, I said the planning happens at the top. The execution happens at the lower level. So the fact that things happen at municipal level or corruption happen, some of that might be mandated from the top. President Mbeki, last year or year before, he attended one of the meetings in the Free State. And he listened to a local politician who was advising the members that we guys must work hard to make sure that the institution, sorry, the Constitution is written in a manner that will ensure that the ANC wins. Now, this is a politician who is saying a Constitution that is supposed to represent the country must potentially be amended to favor the ruling party. That's not a small thing. So I'm therefore saying sometimes the local actor, the civil servant, is acting in a particular way because he or she is serving somebody higher up there who is, is in the invisible. State capture is systemic. It's structured. 
It is driven from powerful individuals from some of the powerful institutions within the state. Make no mistake. I told this story the other time that I, I was a director general of a province. I had, I never sat in, uh, in any interviewing panel. My interviewing panel had recommended to me that this guy, whom I happen to know, is the appropriate person to head the Department of Agriculture. And because he was a, a principal of a college of agriculture somewhere, and of course he had experience, I said, let's bring him in. But in the public service, there's supposed to be a, 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 a period of, uh, what do you call it now? Forgotten. Probation, that's the right word. There's a period, probation period. Every three months you evaluate this person for, uh, for over until 12 months expires. And this person had gone through the first three months. I said, okay. Second three months, I said, okay. Third three months, I said, okay. Then the premier comes, joins on the fourth quarter. He calls me to his office, says, DG, don't confirm this guy. I say, DG, uh, pre Premier, how do I do that? I've already said, good, good, good for, for nine months. Now, how does this person become poor in the fourth quarter? And Mind you, he had already finished the fourth quarter. So it was left with me writing the letter confirming. So I say, Pre Premier, I have no basis of implementing your decision. That's one contact. Let me park it there. He has a person in his office whom he knew very well and I know. He found him there. He says to me, in collaboration with the MEC for, the department, for another department, he says, transfer this person to the Department of Agriculture. I said, Premier, there's no post there. In fact, essentially, you are putting this person additional to the establishment, which virtually means you are expelling him. So I can't do it. I can't take a person from a post and go and put him in a known or no post, additional to the establishment. So one day, the premier, because I used to have meetings with him every Monday, I get to the office, to his office, with my little notes. He says, Mpinga, don't, don't, please, put aside your notes. I've got an agenda. I have a problem. You know that I used to play rugby, which I also used to play. And he says, this is the position I played in rugby. And I made sure that the ball comes out of the scrum to the scrum, to the fly half, to the first center, second center, to the wing, and score. Now, in the few months I've been here, I noticed that each time I take the ball out of the scrum and pass it to you, you fall. So there's no chance of scoring here. Because <laughs> you just collapse with the ball. So I said, Premier, you also know that I played rugby. And we knew each other very well with the Premier. And after every match, 
we had a review. Whether we have won or have lost, we review the performance of the team. And who's responsible for that? As the coach and the captain. In this case, you are the team manager. If you feel that one of the players is causing the team to lose, you either put him on the bench during the match or drop him out of the team. You saw in the last, when we were playing with uh, Britain, with England, Sia, the captain, was in the bench in the final stages of the match. Because the manager had taken that decision. So I said, Premier, I suggest that you do what is best for your team. At that point, that is how I exited from the public service. We agreed, I'll draft a letter. We sign, I sign. And we agree that we don't go to the press to shout at each other, but we, do, we part ways. And that's how I left my position. So what I'm saying is that this was power, pressure put on me. As a director general, mind you, to say, you do this or out. And the choice I had to make was out. Lastly, not waste your time. When I worked for Ford Motor Company in 1978-79, I was to be elected the president of, the Pe of PEPCO, the Port Elizabeth Black Civic Organization. It was headlines in the newspapers. As a work study technician in the production floor, one morning I come into the office, we had an open plan. As I come in, my supervisor says, please come here. And he's carrying Herald, the newspaper. My face is headlined in the newspaper. He says to me, what is this? <laughs> I said, no, it's a, it's a report by a journalist about me. He says, the white management in, on the floor has, br has brought this paper to me. They are not happy by you appearing and getting involved in those kinds of things. Now my question was, this is a civic matter outside of workplace. Has, it, has my work been affected by this in any way. If you say so, I'm happy to abide by whatever decision. Then he says, no. But you must make a choice. Work for Ford or go and work for your organization. I took, I took my scarf in and my jacket and said thank you, and I walked away. Then the workers struck and demanded that I come back. But I leave the story there. Thank you. Mm, thank you for the questions. I will make sure, or I will try, not to get our ambassador in trouble. I will make sure that you remain a free man after this session. Uh, I will start with the question on where you say a state capture is an inter is international affairs of a country. And I will link that to your comment on globalization. I will say that a state capture, we cannot simply say that it's an international, it's an internal affair because of course, when a, the state is captured, resources taken from the state 
most of the time are hidden somewhere else. There is a global network at play. You will, for instance, if you remember the Sanya Bacha case, you see the wealth that Sanya Bacha stole from Nigeria, took the money to Switzerland, and every time, every government in Nigeria want to collect that money back. So although it started in Nigeria, the money was taken away. So we need a global network, safe havens, to, pr to, pr to, to protect or keep the, the money from state captures. And that money goes away through illicit means. And when the pressure is put on safe haven countries, that I don't want to name here, these countries generally, when they want to return the, mon the money, they even attach conditions to it. You, we will give you some of it, but you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. They don't look at your national development plan, but again, they want to use other means to still repossess or control the use of the money. So when we think internally, our state institutions, uh, like the judiciary, uh, should act perhaps as the Sangoma to remedy the problem, uh, how do we then get a hold of global actors like international banks? Because, uh, well, the global north will generally tell you that uh, you Africans, you African, you are corrupt. You go and sort your things. They will organize training, they will organize training for our tax officials, for our judiciaries, how to run the commissions of inquiries. But at no point they will say what is our own responsibilities in, li in leaving this happening. And I will give you an example. Uh, many years ago when I was a student, uh, I went to Canada in Montreal to do my field, my field trip uh, because I was doing some uh, comparative analysis between developed countries uh, with the case of Canada and underdeveloped countries. And I went there and I had, I think, $2,000. And I wanted to stay for three months. And I went to the Bank of Montreal. I wanted to open a bank account. I was called in by the bank manager who was asking me, where did you get the $2,000? And I said, oh my God, poor student. When our leaders come here with planes full of money, do they go through this interview? If they were going through this type of interview to keep all the money that we know that people take away, people will not take the money away. This is to say that when uh, we think, because the international community will always push ball the, box, the, the, the ball on us and say, the buck stop with you. Go and sort your out, sort your things out. But if all this money stolen uh, was invested here, it will create jobs. It will create things. M people might not even know that money was stolen, but all this money go away in other countries. And this is to simply uh, stress that we cannot, uh, can I say, we cannot simply say the question is in international affair, in internal affairs. We cannot, because international community plays a, a huge role. And when we complain, when we talk about this, when we had the Mbeki panel uh, in 2015 on illicit financial flows that established responsibilities of internal actors, they also check at the responsibilities of external actors. And those external actors, they came to the party, they, they adopted many me measures, including the, the latest one was in 2020, uh, the, it was called the FACTI panel or the uh, high level panel on international financial accountability, transparency, integrating 
for achieving the 2030 agenda. That was the, la the, the latest response from the international community. As you look at the name of, of this entity, it talks of financial accountability, transparency, integrity that should be implemented globally to address uh, illicit financial flows. Uh, they also rely on the UN Convention on Anti-Corruption, Anti-Corruption Convention. Uh, although we have these uh, initiatives, they are not implemented. The, and why are they not implemented? Because international relations are informed by what is called the calculus or the theories of self-interest. Because if uh, Switzerland were to return all the money that our just African leaders, starting from Mumbutu, from all this uh, Diamin from years, this continent will not be poor. All the money that we are talking about, I, that's why I say Africa is not poor, but Africa is looted. And the, the proceeds of looting uh, is packed in those countries. It's self-interest. If you take all the resources from Africa back, Switzerland will suffer. Economically, they will not be able to have the life standard they have. And that's why they will always, or all safe haven countries, while they are quick to attend meetings and seminars and training and even propose framework to deal with the issue, on the ground, they do very little to return the proceed of corruption. So we cannot blame globalization for this because globalization itself is not the problem but it's the self-interest and the game of power that is at play. The powerful countries control all the networks. They know what happened, uh, but very little is done to address the issue. And on the question on whether there are specific state institutions that uh, perhaps uh, uh, are implicated or that are complicit of uh, the phenomena of state capture. I think Dr. Botta captured that very well. To, it's not only one state institution. Deep state captures every aspect, including at local level, at municipality level. And that's why when you look at Tuli Madonzela report, the Zondo report, you can see that uh, people were captured not even knowing that they are captured. You, you, you become part of a network. Probably you are given a ticket to go to Dubai for a holiday. You fly business class. Uh, you have some money to shop. Probably your package is 100,000 rand but someone and it's getting 10 million rand, you don't know, simply because you, you went to that trip to, to, to Dubai. So it's not unique to a particular state, but sometimes, or most of the time, as Dr. Botta said, it starts from the top, the rotten head of the fish, as Ambassador says, because uh, you, we, we witnessed in this country how someone was I mean, uh, appointed ministers Minister of Finance for three days. I don't recall if, and that appointment was made at midnight. So what does it tell you? Is this person appointed for a, to sign just a specific thing and go? So you wonder now, even the person who appoints a person at midnight is not free. That person is not free. The person could, wasn't got to a point where he could not say, like Dr. Botta, I also played rugby, and uh, you, you can simply take a decision to ask me to go. So that, it, it tells you the deep state is extremely strong. When you get embezzled into that, at sometimes when your phone rings, you panic. You say, again, my phone, yes. Now it could be who you don't want to take your phone, and you don't know how it, you get there. 
And now you don't know what the paper is going to come to find out about you. This is to say it's not just an institutional thing. And it plays the same in illicit financial flows. All sectors, the mining sector, SaaS, everywhere people are striving to, to some extent, even when you come to work, you don't expect to see a strange proposal. But the person that comes to you, it's so powerful, you just say, oh my God, how do I say no to this? And you find yourself in trouble. So in all state institutions, you are there, you are just the office manager or just the PA of someone. Now you are working with people, you don't know that through you they are getting more than exactly what the, 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 the state needs. They're taking all the resources through you because you are giving information. The way ministers are appointed, it goes everywhere. And to its credit in South Africa, so far, the judiciary is, is still standing strong. Yes, to its credit, because it's, this is the only country not only in Africa, but even in the world, where you see a sitting president betrayed, and people, so it's almost normal to see a, a president being called to court or the former president. But in other places, who are you? He will close that courtroom. They will close that courtroom. They will tell you. In Francophone Af Africa, he was talking about when you talk in Francophone Africa where you have the network of France Afrique that was established by France to control who get appointed, who does not get appointed, who get business deals. All these networks, as he was talking about, Shell, uh, Total, all these networks uh, were established to control the resources. And in those countries, uh, the president of the republic is the head of the judiciary, meaning as a judge or as a mag magistrate, you are just a public servant. Now, if you want to query the president, if you are, let's say, here in Pretoria, they will send you somewhere in Kwamashu, or even far, very far, where you have nothing to do but to look after the cattle and, and read your newspaper. This is to say, we, to the credit of the country, we still have a judiciary that, is, that can scare these guys. At least at the local level, we cannot, we cannot be unhappy with the judiciary. Of course, when I say that, of course, when the, the discourse become politicized, they say the judiciary is fighting the battle for this camp and these other camps. But I will just tell you, it, on this continent, there is no way you will bring a former head of state. Not to say a sitting head of state who must come or who must explain what happened uh, at Palapala with the dollars. Somewhere else, they even carry that money in front of you. Who are you? Who are you to ask the questions? You, the judge, but then you will lose your job and get arrested as the agenda uh, that the ambassador was saying earlier. Perhaps I must stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I actually have promised a, another round of, uh, of questions, uh, but I see that time is also not on our side. If we can squeeze about three, two, two last questions. Oh, I see a lot now. <laughs> um, I'm going to take two from this side and two from this side. So, madam, you'll be the first. Say at the back, in front, say, and you say on the right. Um, for all of you who have questions, the speakers are still here. We're going to eat with them. You can still engage with okay. them. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, I just Very brief, please. Yeah, yeah. One quick question is the role of um, universities in state capture, it, it doesn't seem to come out very much, not in, even in the commission. 
my next question is that um, I think state capture helped uh, South African citizens because of how it distilled, I mean, the commission, how it distilled um, state capture, its machinations, and so on. What it doesn't do, a, a, and it followed individuals, it gave what, what uh, uh, NGOs would call case studies. What it doesn't do is to distill how Adrian Flock, for example, used the same method as an apartheid uh, a minister. It, uh, that information for me, it's, it's a little bit not there, and I, I think it becomes a moment of not learning for, for even a, a younger people um, in South Africa, how we do not distill that apartheid machination around a state capture using a, a case study. Thank you. Thank you. Second one. Thank you, sir. My name is Oscar Madlala. Um, two simple questions. I've been listening to presenters. It, the question is not going to any specific person. Anyone can take the question. Um, aren't we part of, of um, actually, aren't we condoning this corruption as citizens? Because we, we continue to vote in a system, we continue to vote for the same people in the system that oppresses us. Why are we so loyal? We complain. Um, we've, we've had uh, commissions after commissions. Money has been spent on the Zondo Commission. And why is it so difficult to investigate and arrest? Uh, Prof. Lumumba once said this at some point, that <laughs> arrest one minister, at least. Then people will begin to understand. But it looks like we, 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 we are aware of what our problem is, but we are not part of the solution. I'll give you a quick example. A person is corrupt in a small municipality at a local level. Uh, they are audited. They are findings. Instead of removing a person from power, we redeploy. What are we saying? It means you are a liability in this municipality, so we transfer this liability. To, to another, either in the district, and what do we expect? Uh, so it looks like it's a cycle, man. We, we, uh, we know what our problem is, and it will be very interesting, the outcome of next year. I don't know what will be your take on that one, but what is our role in this process? Aren't we condoning the system? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Are we not partners in crime? Sorry, I, Amadi Echendu, Emeritus Professor, University of Pretoria. The young man asked the question, how do we solve this problem? And I wanted to reiterate that because he will be around for a lot longer than I will be. So he needs an answer. And let me suggest an answer to him. Uh, I know you guys have your leadership. We, our concept of leadership is of a person who is at a position. No, no. As my wife says to me, you are the head and I'm the neck. Uh, and I will turn the neck. She says, you are the head of the family, but I will turn the neck. Because where I turn the neck, that's where the head goes. So, I've just come back from Vietnam and India. And I listened to my tour guide carefully. And I realized that the reason why Vietnam is getting more tourists is because there is less crime. It's young people who are protecting that environment and making sure nothing happens so that those people that we're talking about, globalization and all that, happens. Can we, young people, start looking and saying, no, we've got to do something about crime? Because leadership, if you take it higher and higher, what we are talking about is criminal behavior, isn't it? So let's, let's start now and say, no, we're not going to break those cables. We're not going to do these things. If a tourist comes here, because all of those imperialists, they come as tourists initially. They don't come as imperialists initially. They come as a tourist. So perhaps let's start looking at leadership differently. Somebody who turns the neck turns the head. 
So the leaders are not the head. The leaders are the people who turn the neck. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. And, and thanks. Uh, you know, in Setuana, they say, Moja Mora Hoke Kosi. If, uh, please check your time. If I go for more than two minutes, cut me because I want to save your time. <laughs> the, the young man took my weight, and I may look as young as him. A lot of people think I'm young. I'm Botsa Mwilwa. I'm known as a very controversial political analyst. I'm a career diplomat by profession, and I am a student of the Tawombeki School. I'm going not to burden them with questions. I just want to make a comment. The problem, what is the problem? The problem is democracy and the glorified constitution that Prof referred to. We are sitting in South Africa with the world's most glorified constitution. That one, I've asked questions. If it's so glorified, if it's so good that even musicians like Vusima Thasela made a song about it, Tongana, how come no other country in the world has used it as a model or copied it? Not even one, if it's that good. Number two, how come our glorified good constitution be regarded as the best in the world when it has created a society that is the most unequal in the world? Prof said it himself. We are the most unequal society, not because of apartheid. We brought in a constitution after apartheid that was supposed to reverse and or correct the ills of apartheid. But we became the most unequal in the world until today. I have served and lived in Brazil, Mozambique, and Rwanda. We are worse than them. Number three, somebody spoke of uh, uh, the independence of the judiciary, the executive, as well as the legislative authority. Where, colleagues? Where? I'm a graduate of Fabian Institution, and I've maintained for over the years. There is no independence, and I'll break it down quickly. How is it independent when we, the voters, to your question, we vote and we elect people that go and sit in where? The legislative assembly. The political parties list those people. They submit their names before we vote. So when we vote, we know who is in the list of which political party. 400 and odd of them sit in parliament. That is the legislative authority. What do they do? They go and they elect the executive authority. So the 400 people decide who's the president. The president goes and appoints the executive authority where is the independence then? We vote for people, they elect the president, he goes and appoints the executive authority, the cabinet ministers. It doesn't end there. I've heard the judiciary being praised. We are being told they are independent. Where? Where is the judiciary himself independent when the Judicial Service Commission, which is supposed to be an independent body like other chapter nine institutions, it's been elected or chosen or selected by those MPs committees, so MPs, some with metric, some with criminal records, they go and they decide who the judges of these countries are and make recommendations to the president who signs them off. Where is independence there? Where is the, in there's no independence in these three legs of government. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sure some of the, the questions and comments would warrant a very lengthy engagement as well. But I'll, but I'll ask uh, the, the, the presenters to be brief in, in responding to these questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I would like to start with uh, perhaps the final comment on the independence of the judiciary. Why will, while I completely agree with you that there is a serious problem with the way uh, judges are appointed, when they get to office, they can be very surprisingly independent in the sense that, I will give you one example. When our former Chief Justice Mukwen Mukwen was appointed, the legal fraternity was kind of shocked because looking at his judgment before his appointment, nobody expected him to go after the executive. And when he came out with the 
can lie judgment. It was a shocker. It was a surprise. Nobody expected Justice Mokwen Mokwen to, to be as, actually it like it went after former President Zuma. And the legal fraternity was basically a surprise and to the extent that we were shocked to say but nobody, because everybody thought he will just be there to rubber stamp things from the executive. It did not happen. And that was a sign of being independent from the executive. So, and we saw it again when you, you look at the case of now former public protector. When she came in, some expectations, of course the expectation was probably she was going to be like Tuli. But you could see how the state institution could remove her from office. Again, this is also interpreted as being politics at play. But when you look at the current judiciary, and I was giving you the example that even if there can be some flaws with appointment procedures, whenever a judge is now sworn in, uh, when you look at the way the system works, at least we have some check and balances that if you want to do comparative analysis with what takes place in other countries, you will kind of say, wow, South Africa is doing very well. Because as I mentioned, the, in many other countries, you have presidents who live abroad. They come home for holiday, but they live abroad because they want to enjoy the medical facilities that are in Geneva. And ambassadors, you see, I don't want to name the country, so I'm becoming like you. I'm becoming careful here. So, so the, we have so many of these countries where uh, the judiciary has no say. And in terms of uh, democracy, I also will say we have, perhaps democracy again in South Africa has its flaws. But again, do a bit of comparative analysis and you will see that South Africa will be leading on the continent because at least here we vote and you don't understand that people uh, defrauded, they took, they, they stole the vote, you don't see this. But in other places, someone has 99% of vote. How come? How come? Is it God? You know, so we don't have this type of figures here. And that's why uh, somewhere else, many people look at South Africa as the light where there is a bit of hope. That's why when we started struggling with load shedding, people are saying, oh my God. So if we are getting to load shedding, as soon as you get a job, the first thing you must buy is a generator. That's what the, the worries of everyone. And getting to load shedding was almost like, now we are copying what is happening in other places on the continent. And the democracy, the democratic system might have these flaws. Where else you see a public protector standing up like we so truly doing? I'm telling you in many of our countries, you dare that that office will be closed for good. They will just sign a decree to say we don't need this, uh, it doesn't advance our democracy. So we, when we criticize uh, I, what happened here, I agree we should be activists and request the best. We should request uh, the best state institutions possible, the best functioning, but we should not ignore that uh, we are moving towards a good direction where we have some challenges. And this, uh, this takes me to the question of the Constitution. Of course, the Constitution uh, has been very much criticized, and you are correct. We are living in a very inequal society. 
the Constitution has been really attacked for that. And people like uh, Zanele Sibanda, he says the Constitution uh, is built on a new liberal ideology copy from Canada, the US, and the UK, and that cannot uh, uh, provide an equal equalitarian society. This, this one is also made by Mojire, by Shai, who believe that the culture of the country does not really transpire in the Constitution. But uh, can we say the Constitution is the problem or the implementers of the provision of the Constitution? We saw that unlike in other countries, the Constitution has a Bill of Rights, meaning education, food, sanitation, water, electricity, everything should be provided for by law. In other places, these are just state, the principle of state policy, non-binding, meaning you cannot ask the state, you cannot take the state to court if, they, if you don't have electricity. All Francophone Africa constitution are like that. Many, the Nigerian constitution, Ugandan constitution, these things are there, but they are not binding. So they are binding here. And we see, we saw in South Africa, the state taken to court for housing, for antiretroviral uh, therapy, uh, in the treatment action campaign case, in the Goodboom case, the housing case, the Masiboku case, the right to water. So these things have been litigated and the state has been found guilty of not providing. Again, the challenge is how do we force the state to provide? So there is a problem between normative provisions and normative compliance. We can, that's why when we look and criticize what happens in South Africa, we, we must recognize what is happening uh, at the state level. The right to education here is a right. The state is forced to produce education free of charge. It doesn't happen in many countries, in many of our countries. So, and these things are provided for in the Constitution. So for me, besides uh, Section 25 on the right to property, which is very controversial, the Constitution provides a map to build an equalitarian society. Now the question is leadership. How does leadership do this? First way is not to steal, not to, not, not to take money away through illicit flows, as we are talking about. And I want to touch on your question uh, in closing uh, by statement. Uh, the, the citizenship, the citizen condoning what is happening, it's a big challenge. And I agree, there is a problem because uh, as Professor said, we, will, we are going to election next year and we are quickly going to go and vote probably for the same people. But that's what happened when we are emotionally attached to our liberation movement. It's not unique to South Africa. It takes time because when the time of campaigning time will arrive, the ANC will say, we brought you this freedom. We brought you this right to vote. We brought, it's emotional. And remember, we are talking this, is like a church of people speaking the same language. But go to our rural areas, where our granny, they know the ANC, they know the fight, they know the history, they know what we want. And some people will actually, uh, because even in, not only the ANC, you know, some people who, in my view, don't have a political uh, program, they will simply say, uh, this country is where it is because of foreigners. But I want to see the political program. And because of poverty, because of inequality, they will get vote for that. It's populism. They don't tell you how they will address this institutional crisis, 
this high level corruption. They don't tell you that, but they say, uh, no, no. And even the ANC might actually join that chorus because it brings votes. We must bash all these foreigners, they must go. But this is what some political party thrive on. Because most of the time you ask, uh, what is the program of governance? You might not see that. And so people play on emotion. And you understand, in a context of poverty and inequality, uh, those who are really in dire need will buy the story without even checking that, okay, how many foreigners are there? How many are doing this? How many are doing that? And how many are held accountable for whatever uh, crime they are committing? So when it's time to vote, people don't even think. They think, oh my God, no, we cannot have anybody else uh, beside ANC. And it's the reward. It's the reward. And it's the reward for political liberation that what people are still sitting and striving on and trying to say if the ANC is not there, probably apartheid will be back. So to vote as you are saying, uh, we, we think uh, perhaps we are not as voters, perhaps voting uh, where we should be voting. But on the other hand, what tells you that changing the political church or moving from the ANC will necessarily bring the, uh, bring the public good? So there is also a risk. There is also a risk. And we cannot simply say, because we are having these challenges, the ANC must be necessarily booted out of power. I disagree. I disagree. We, sim we simply need to say how, if we want to vote the ANC again, uh, how can we force them to do what needs to be done properly? What way, what are the tools of control we can put on the table to get a positive result? Because uh, if you change, uh, you, rust, you run the risk. Sometimes it is said that when you get married twice, that way you know exactly which of the wife or the husband was a better one. So there is always a risk of changing. But we should rather perhaps be trying to see what political program those political parties, all of them, are presenting and what is the substance to take the country to another level. And I think on your question on the role of universities on state capture, I think that wasn't well articulated in my view, but universities at this stage, we must do more work and research on state capture. And that's why uh, the Faculty of Law of the University of the Free State is currently doing a project with the Tabumbeki School on illicit financial flows and state capture that will cover a good part of next year. So we need to encourage more research, more writing, more work uh, in making this issue on the map as to guide uh, our researchers, our policy makers, and our commentators on the issue. Thank you very much. I'll only answer one question because it's, we run out of time. Uh, that question is the one, how do we uh, solve this problem? Uh, you know the importance of civil society, the role of civil society in the, build, the development of a state. Uh, one of the organizations uh, let me say, two organizations that are supposed to be part of the anchor of civil society is the trade union movement and the civic associations in our society. 
If you look at the role of civics during the apartheid period, most of the municipalities which were imposed on the people were removed because by the civic, by the civic associations based on the strength they had within the community. Post-apartheid, the problem was that civics be became allies of the ruling political party. Therefore, they lost their independence. Now, <coughs> uh, in 1992, I was asked this question, and there was a special issue of theoria uh, publication, a journal, which asked the question, what is going to be the role of civic associations post apartheid? My, my answer was, civic associations should remain autonomous structures of civil society, but they can enter into strategic alliances with political parties subject to the issues that affect the community. Now, Sanko currently is very weak. It's going to a conference or conferences the end of this year, next month. There's two Sankos. Each of them call themselves national. And they call their conferences national. Now, there's an allegation of corruption within the very same Sanko structures who are allied to the political parties. And therefore, to say that civil society's intervention may resolve this problem is actually a myth. Because why do I say so? I ask the question from some of them. Why are you rushing to have conferences now end of this year? Some of them don't even have the resources for the conference. They say, no. The reality is that having the elections of the Sanko structure at this point, those elected there have a better chance of getting into the list of the ANC next year. So you see, I'm saying within the civil society organization there's corrupt practices. They are standing in the list of the ANC if it wins or whatever, whether it's at provincial or local government level. So the infection, the virus infection, already carries from here to there. So that is not this. So there's a, a bigger solution. The involvement of the public in these so-called structures of civil society and political parties. What role do the public have in appointing or electing representatives into those political structures? If the people who are electing are contaminated, if you look at the ANC, the ANC branches are said to be branches of people, not of the ANC. The ANC, the leaders buy the voters to attend the meeting. That is going to decide, nominate members to go into the list. So it's a very chain, it's a very worrying chain reaction. But quickly, before I run, the question was asked, about the universities. Quickly, the universities, I know the professor has answered this question, but the worrying thing about the, some of the noises we hear on the universities, for example, I'm not so sure whether it's still corruption or not, but if you look at an university that is very credible, UCT, there's demonstrations and placards remove the vice chancellor. That has happened in this institution, this very institution. The union, I'm not talking about this particular institution, but the union in some of the institutions decide who they want appointed in which position. If the union does not agree, then that person might not be appointed. And that's a problem. And it's not just the union, the factions within the universities, the academic structure. So the corruption is not, is rather is not um, exclusively 
in institutions outside of this very same institution. Whether you go to Forte, you're going to find the same problem. You, you go to Nelson Mandela, it's going to be the same problem. Vice Chancellor has hardly finished their terms. And these are highly rated institutions. And the issue is not, is this going to be the constitution of the university that is wrong? No. It's the people who are implementing and applying the constitution who are actually abusing some of the powers vested in them to again divert the objectives so that they want to appoint, to appoint their own people in certain strategic positions for various reasons. You may or may not agree with me, but that is a fact. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Buerta. Thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Serge Kamga. Um, you know, always time is an enemy when you are having fun in terms of the flow of ideas. Now, as I've indicated, those of you who still have questions and uh, comments that you want to make, um, um, the speakers are still here. We're going to share lunch with them. Please engage them even further. I'm going to call upon um, the last person who is going to do the closing remark, and that is Professor Beitendach. She is my colleague. She is the head of the Simulation and Futuristic Studies. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. We've been talking about a state capture, but let me tell you, um, I'm the victim of time capture. So um, I have to squeeze in um, my comments in a very short time. And as you might imagine, appreciate, it is extremely difficult to summarize the vast array of, of, of very powerful comments and questions that were coming from both our presenters as well as, as the floor. Um, so I, I would like to just briefly, I, th I think I will also, um, I do not want to miss the opportunity to, to, to thank um, Professor Mahanu once again for um, his introduc introductory remarks on behalf of the VC, uh, because it truly, truly um, was setting the, the, the scene and, the, and introduced a number of the arguments that were actually addressed um, by both the presenters and the, and, and the floor. Um, and then our keynote's most important um, contributors, um, and Dr. Bota, as well as Professor Kamga, thank you very much for your thought-provoking presentations and, and really breaking open um, a number of the ideas and you did not shy away of, of, of really sharing with us um, various perspectives on this issue of, of, of state capture. All right, so let me just quickly try to, 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 to capture um, Dr. Bota's um, um, presentation. Um, his presentation centered around the origin, the nature, and the status of, of state capture in, in South Africa. And there were four issues that I actually want to highlight from his, um, from his presentation. The one um, important one is the fact that state capture is not new. Um, it follows the imperialistic um, charter and is a legacy and um, that, creates the found that created the foundation for the current um, scenario that we actually um, are faced with. Then he touched about, he called it and referred to the economic hitman, but the abuse of ec the economy as an instrument by rich and powerful countries, to, um, to, um, for example, through development aid, to capture the recipient countries via conditionalities. 
and that ha those have a significant impact because more than often the objective is to enrich themselves and exploiting in particular the vulnerabilities of a developing country because these rich and powerful countries more than often are, are the developed um, economies. Um, he also endeavored along the line of defining state capture and um, trying to, 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 to just summarize the essence, my takeaway was that it boils down to a collective exercise. It is um, alliance between various actors, um, internal as well as, 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 as foreign actors. And then he made the point that, um, that South Africa is not South Africa's state is not captured, but we are in a state of state capturing, meaning and highlighting the fact that there are, the there are conditions that are currently present in our, and that, that has been, um, pardon the word, institutionalized and embedded. As Professor Kamga said, it's in our deep, deep society, deep economy, deep institutions that actually enables um, a state capture or the, the imminent danger and the risk of a state capture. Um, Professor Kamga uh, um, um, graced us with his presentation and what he did was to bridge this gap between, um, between um, state capture and illicit um, financial flows. And his introductory words were that, that um, illicit financial flows um, is the road that enables um, state capture. So, deducing and trying to create a common ground between illicit financial flows and, and state capture, I would like if you can, can um, uh, appreciate the following and tolerate me for, 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 for criticizing and it in the, in the next way is to say that we in both instances are talking about the illicit flow of resources, irrespective of whether it's the origin is internally or whether it is externally. All right, Professor Kamga then, um, he went on by explaining to us um, exactly what is meant with um, um, illicit financial flows, and it's very important that it takes on various, various dimensions and, and, and operates through various avenues. Sometimes we only think about stuff like um, international capital flows, but we are also talking about local um, issues um, where you have got the evasion and the avoidance of legislation which uh, were put in place to assure the distribution of our resources towards the vulnerable and towards growing this country of ours to the benefit of all. And that is why these avenues and the vulnerabilities that we face are so important. Um, he emphasized the importance of this by um, explaining and give us a few frightening numbers about the magnitude of, of illicit financial flows and, and it really is like a cancer. Um, it's, it's, it's embedded, it's real, and for the larger part of it, we are blind and, and, and ignorant about the, the, the extent of illicit financial flows. And then if um, continued, or, or he actually concluded by talking about the impact of illicit financial flows. Now, um, important, he also mentioned, which we usually don't think about, about the, the impact enables of in, in, um, illicit financial flows um, enables further um, atrocities like the human trafficking, drug trafficking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and the net impact is ultimately both state capture and illicit financial flows is that this country cannot deliver on its mandate. 
because it has been robbed from its resources. Um, it really introduced a, a number of comments and, and evoked a number of comments and questions. I'm just going to type, um, touch on a, on, on, on a key, key few of them. Um, so I'm just going to use keywords. Um, the issues that were highlighted, the role of leadership, understanding the, the true and nature and the extent of the impact of both state capture and, and illicit flows. And then the overarching theme was throughout, how do we get out of this mess? What are the solutions? What are the interventions? Um, other issues that were addressed or put on the floor um, was that we need to understand the distinction or maybe even the relationship between the actors and the institutions in terms of, of, of state capture or resource capturing. Um, the globalization, international affairs and policy came to the fore. Um, the national key points actually introduced the issue of, of the economy, the very, um, which is the heartbeat and literally the heart, as um, um, Dr. Botta actually emphasized so eloquently, um, of, of, of everything, of development and, and of, of, of enabling individuals. Um, very important component, what were the lessons? What are the lessons that we can learn from the past? And this includes um, apartheid as well, um, in directing our way forward. Um, then um, the, the, the issue was made that um, what is the role of citizens in, in, in ensuring and participating and being part of the solution and to get rid of of this continued corruption. The role of universities, very important, and that's why we as a university is actually um, creating this platform. And I will conclude with a research agenda or just a few ideas of a research agenda, which you all are being, uh, which you all are form, uh, which you all form part of. Um, then um, the very important point was made about the importance of the role of the youth, our future leaders, to be part and parcel of the future. Um, the issue of lacking independence, um, and that actually linked, was linked to ideologies. All right, so flowing from this, I actually try to, 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 to highlight a few uh, themes or topics that, are, uh, that could emanate from this and, and, and direct um, the, um, the way forward for studies um, and research between our collaborators as well as at the Tabo and Becky School. And as I've said earlier, the overarching theme is where to now and how what are the solutions and what is the way forward. So what it boils down to is that we have to, and this is important, first and foremost understand what is the true nature and extent of, and I'm going to use the word, resource capturing um, in South Africa and, and obviously also in Africa. Then we need to understand what is the full impact. Because if we do not understand these, we will design solutions that will be ill-directed and it will not solve the real cause and the real root of the problem. Um, more specifically, I would just like to highlight a few areas that are linked to the focus areas at the Tabo Mbeki uh, School. Um, Pardon me, I'm listing it first because I'm responsible for simulation of futuristic studies, so I'm always forward looking. Um, so for me, from where I see my personal role and people assisting me in that, would be in developing future scenarios, um, in evaluating possible um, solutions that may benefit not only um, um, South Africa, but the rest of the continent because we are all interlinked. And also linked to this is to simulate the impact of the traje uh, trajectory, development trajectory that we are experiencing because more than often we are ignorant about where are we actually heading. 
other areas that are critical for our research are, are the role of the political economy in Africa, peace, stability, and, in, uh, and security issues, governance, leadership, um, local and rural development, um, international um, relations, um, affairs, and uh, foreign um, policies, and this includes the role of multinational um, 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 national corporations, and then the very important role of citizenship. So finally, I would like to invite each and every participant to sh continue share your ch um, continue to share your, your your comments and inputs and your perspective. So you are welcome to get in touch with us. Please, we invite you to get in touch with us because if we get back to so the role of citizenship, you should be involved in designing the solution. These things can't be desktop stuff. It can't be ivory towers of research. It can't be just um, 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 preference-based solutions. We have to come up with solid solutions. We are hanging on the cliff, and now I'm, bothering with, um, I'm borrowing from my colleagues. So the importance of these issues of to recapture our country, lo lovely, thank you, I'm stealing that phrase, recapturing our country um, and our continent cannot be emphasized enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof, for giving us uh, that comprehensive summary. Uh, you know, being an African, when an elder asks you something, you never say no. So <laughs> as I was sitting, uh, Ambassador uh, Dr. Obodozi uh, called me quickly and said, I want you to share with the audience uh, my website. But he didn't tell me what we are going to find in the website. So it is uh, a question mark, but it's something that all of us can try and, 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 and find out. His website is www.obodozi, and it is spelled S O B O D O Z I E. Obodozi, www um, finally, I just want to thank you, uh, because as I look uh, at the front row, we have the High Commissioner um, of Singapore, um, we have the Ambassador, we have professors, we have a lot of dignitaries in their own right in this room. And on behalf of the Tabombeki African School of Public and International Affairs, I wish to thank you for being a very active audience. And uh, in future, we wish we can have more time to engage throughout the day on just on one topic until we really exhaust it. And uh, we also wish to, th to invite you to lunch, which is served to my right. My right will be your left. So please join us um, for lunch and further engagement. Thank you very much. <laughs>